This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey me, aren't you in the wrong dimension? Yeah, but I thought I'd help me with my video on deconvolution. Great, we can talk about PSFs. And Fourier transforms. And division. Division? That'd be great. I like division. Except in deconvolution. But that's for another time. To understand deconvolution, we first have to understand some other things, like diffraction and refraction. And the most important thing we need to understand is this. Your image will always be blurry. There is only blurry and less blurry. Perfect sharpness may be the goal, but it is an impossible one. I'll give four reasons why this is the case and what you can do to fix it. We'll even dive into point spread functions. It would be awesome. Welcome to Deep Sky Detail. All right. So why is it impossible to achieve perfect sharpness? Well, what do I mean when I say perfect sharpness? Let's talk about stars. Stars are so far away that their angular size is really tiny on your camera's sensor. The farther away something is, the smaller it appears to us. So basically a star, even a bright one, should be one pixel wide on your camera sensor. That's impossible. Well, we'll talk about four reasons why it's impossible in this video. The reasons will be ordered from roughly having the least effect on your image's sharpness to having the most effect on your image's sharpness. We'll also talk about how all of these things combine through convolution to make a point spread function. But first, a demo. So I'm out here in my garage. Here is a laser pointer that I use to collimate my telescope. Attached to this tripod with my GoPro is a fishing line. I want to have this laser hit the middle of the fishing line. So what do you think will happen? Maybe it'll create a shadow on the wall. Let's see. All right, so I'm moving the laser, moving it to get it perfect. There, look, I've done it. Can you see it? The laser creates a line that is perpendicular to the orientation of the string. But what's going on? Before I zoom in for a closer look, Let's back up with a computer simulation real quick. This pulsating thing in the middle represents a light source emitting light in all directions. The white are the peaks of the wave and the black are the troughs. The red line is an obstacle. Look what happens when the light waves reach the obstacle. They start to bend around it. In other words, they diffract. It's almost as if we have two new point sources of light where the edges are. As the waves bend around the edges, they start to meet up, and as they meet up, they should start interfering with each other like this. Where the peaks from the light combine, we get brighter areas. Where the peaks from one edge meets the trough of the other, they destructively interfere, creating dark areas. But can we see that with the laser in my garage? Well, I've increased the distance from the fishing line in the wall, and I think you can. There are brighter areas and darker areas where the, the light is interfering with itself. It's pretty cool. But what does this have to do with my images? So look at this string. Now look at the lens of my telescope. They're the same thing, right? All right, they're not the same thing, but they do the same thing, kind of. Instead of a straight line obstruction like the string is to the laser, the opening of my telescope is a circular obstruction to light coming in from space. It creates diffraction. The diffraction from your telescope limits what you can resolve. It puts a theoretical and practical limit on how sharp your images can be. Instead of a diffraction pattern that forms a straight line, like the string, the diffraction pattern forms a series of concentric rings called the airy disk. The radius of the center of the airy disk is the theoretical resolving power of your telescope. Now get ready. I'm going to give you a math equation to figure out how to find the approximate resolving power of your own telescope in visible light. is very complex, amazingly complex. So the radius in arc seconds that your telescope can resolve, wait for it, is about 134 divided by the diameter of your telescope's aperture in millimeters. That's it. I know, <laughs> it's complicated. I hope we can still be friends. Critically though, the resolving power of your telescope also depends on the wavelength of light you're imaging. 
the real formula is this, where lambda is the wavelength and d is the diameter of your telescope. Why is aperture so important? Well, I think an intuitive explanation might be that the circumference of the circle's opening doesn't increase at the same rate as the area of the opening. With small apertures, a greater proportion of the wave entering the scope gets diffracted compared to a larger aperture. Unfortunately, there is no escape from blurriness created by the diffraction unless you have an aperture of infinite size. Okay, so let's talk about the other physical limitations of your telescope. This is the second thing that makes your images blurry. Diffraction is a given in any telescope design. We know that now. But you're also limited by the flaws of your telescope. If you have a refractor, then you might suffer from field curvature. Basically, the light does not focus at the same point in the corners as it does in the center. You can get the center in near-perfect focus or the edges in near-perfect focus, but not both unless you have a special type of refractor. Similar to field curvature, chromatic aberrations also make things blurry for refractors. Lenses don't focus all wavelengths of light the same, so blue light might be blurrier than red light when taking an image. If you use a Newtonian, then you might suffer from coma, where point sources of light are focused into comet-like shapes in the edges of the field. Newtonians suffer most from coma because incoming light that is off axis to the primary mirror doesn't get focused as pinpoints of light. Rather, the focus is distorted depending on the angle the incoming light is compared to the primary mirror. Luckily, you can buy field flatteners, apochromatic refractors, do good collimation, and buy coma correctors to mostly get rid of these effects. There are a ton of other distortions that make things blurry too, like astigmatism, spherical aberrations, pinched optics, and other things. But I think the most common are field curvature, chromatic aberration, and coma. What's bad though is that the airy disk and the flaws in the telescope design combine to make things even blurrier. Horrible. So real quick, let's talk about point spread functions now. The last two problems are more scary. They make our images even blurrier, but let's pause a second to talk about point spread functions. What is a point spread function? Before I give you a definition, let me open up GIMP. I'm going to draw a star what? <laughs> you say this isn't a star? Well, let me tell you what. If I had perfect optics and an infinitely sized aperture, I'd be, uh, I mean, this is what the star would look like on my sensor. One pixel. Remember this part of the video? Well, what do I mean when I say perfect sharpness? Let's talk about stars. Stars are so far away that their angular size is really tiny on your camera's sensor. The farther away something is, the smaller it appears to us. So basically a star, even a bright one, should be one pixel wide on your camera's sensor. So this is it, my image of a star. It is a point. But let's add some imperfections into the optics. See how the star, which was originally a point, ends up spread out over a whole bunch of pixels? Well, that's the point spread function. For astrophotography purposes, a point spread function is basically this. It is a model for how your point of light, like a star, spreads out over your camera sensor. Nice. When we take a point of light and combine it with our point spread function, we get our output image of a star. The process of combining the ground truth, the ground truth meaning what the image would actually look like in a perfect world with perfect optics, combining that ground truth with the point spread function is called, and this will be our little secret, convolution. <laughs> convolution involves a lot of multiplication. A lot, unless you do a Fourier transformation. Then it's not as much multiplication, but still a decent amount. But that's a video for another day. Okay, back to the third item on our blurry list. So airy disks are not much of a problem, and there are options to make your optics better to remove flaws like coma and other things. Things aren't ideal, but there are solutions. Our next problem can be a real pain, even with good solutions. And, and that's tracking and guiding errors. When your equatorial mount rotates around its right ascension axis, it's not perfect. Sometimes the motors track a bit too fast, sometimes they track a bit too slow. 
Sometimes there is backlash that makes your mount not move at all. All this moving back and forth makes the star look like a line. In other words, its point gets spread out linearly. In the absence of optical errors, your airy disc should now look like an airy oval. Horrible. So what can we do about it? Well, you can do auto guiding with a guide camera and a program like PhD2. And you can get a better mount. Easy. Just spend more money. Here's some affiliate links. Just kidding. Just kidding. Guiding and a good mount are good solutions, but one thing you can also do is just take shorter sub-exposures. A lot of astro cameras are really sensitive now, and long exposures, at least for RGB imaging, are no longer required. You'll have to worry about walking noise though, which is bad, but even without an auto-guiding setup, you can mitigate tracking errors by shorter exposures and unguided dithering. Okay, so we're almost at the most serious thing that makes your images blurry. But before we get into that, did you know I made a neural network that can help sharpen your astrophotography images? By making the neural network, I learned a ton, and that's why I recommend today's sponsor, Brilliant. You might be interested in neural networks too, but don't know exactly where to start. I recently checked out their Introduction to Neural Networks course. It does a really good job easing you into the topic, from talking about real neurons to artificial neurons, inputs, outputs, layered networks, and other things. Brilliant gives you hands-on experience with easy to understand examples. The lesson pairs very well with programming with Python. Maybe one day I'll make a large language model in Python based on what I learned. One thing Brilliant understands is that learning takes time and people are busy. So you can set up a plan that's right for you and practice a little bit daily. The lessons will compound and before you know it, you'll be learning something new and interesting every day. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash deep sky detail or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. We've come to it at last. The most important, hardest thing to get rid of, most random type of blur in astrophotography. But wait one minute. We've talked about aerodists and guiding errors and optical aberrations, but how do they combine? Like, how does coma combine with guiding errors? And how do those combine with the ground truth to make an image? Well, you can think about convolution sort of like regular multiplication, meaning that you can arrange things differently and still get the same answer. You can convolve the ground truth with the tracking error and then convolve the tracking error with the optical aberrations and you'll get your final image. Or you can convolve the optical aberrations with the tracking error to get an overall PSF and then convolve the overall PSF with the ground truth to get your final image. It's really that simple. So how do you perform convolution? Well, as I said earlier, that's a video for another day. So the last and most insidious source of blurriness is, and take a deep breath, and it's in your lungs now. Yeah, good job, it's the atmosphere. Don't get me wrong, I love air, I breathe it all the time. But it does make your images blurry, and that's because air is a fluid, and it refracts light incoming from space. Refraction is just the bending of a light wave as it passes from one medium to another. If it was just the simple bending that were the problem though, we wouldn't care so much. The real problem is that the air is turbulent. It's moving all around in the sky. The type of air that the light passes through and its density affect how much it bends. So as light moves from the vacuumous space into the atmosphere, it bends. But the atmosphere is not uniform. Some of the air above your telescope is more dense than other parts. Instead of one bend in the light like you might see as light passes through glass, you get multiple bends that are constantly changing. The end result is that when your sensor is taking an image, the light from stars and other objects don't just hit one spot. It moves around. You can see this very clearly when taking a video of the moon. It looks like we're imaging the moon through a fluid because we are. Seeing puts a hard limit of what your telescope can resolve on a given point. On very good nights with a big enough aperture, you might be able to resolve objects that are half an arc second across. And that's not bad, but on bad nights it might be four or five arc seconds. So real quick, let's talk about Hubble and why it is in space. Hubble's primary mirror is 2.4 meters in diameter. Hubble's resolution is 0.05 to 0.1 arc seconds. If it were in space and without adaptive optics, Hubble would be five to 10 times worse. Astronomical seeing is a major reason you don't see a lot of amateur astrophotography telescopes larger than 280 millimeters or 11 inches. You'll rarely, if ever, get 
better than 0.5 arc seconds of resolution due to the atmosphere, which is about the diffraction limit of an 11 inch telescope. You will see visual telescopes that are much larger though, and that's because while visual observing, light gathering ability is paramount, and larger mirrors are great for that. Hey me, are you done? No, I've got tons more to talk about, like calculating co convolution, deconvolution, signal to noise ratios, and the Wiener filter. I'm serious. Well, I've been spying on Dr. Detail, and apparently he's been spying on us and our video. And guess what? He's making a video. In it, he claims we're fools and not talking about circles. Circles, huh? Yeah, circles. Makes sense. We are fools. Circles are very important to this conversation. I've got to get in my spaceship and talk to him. See you in that video. What are you waiting for? Just click it. It's a cool video. Thanks for watching.